Today, I want to talk to you about something maybe you've never, ever heard before, um, talked about. And it's really important that you do because this right here is the crux of your entire relationship with God. And whether or not you're going to have your future and your destiny is going to be based on how well you do what I'm going to talk about today. 1 Kings 12, 26 through 28. 1 Kings 12, 26 through 28. I'm going to begin to read. I want you to listen to these first few words. Jeroboam thought to himself, unless I am careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David. When these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord, they will again give their allegiance to King Rehoboam of Judah. They will kill me and they'll make him their king instead. So on the advice of his counselors, the king made two gold calves. He said to his people, it is too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. What's going on right now? Well, there's a man who's seeing that David is still alive. He's a well-loved king. God is giving him favor everywhere. This man also is a king. There's been a lot of drama that's happened up to this point. Kingdoms have divided. Some people are with David. Some people are with him. But he get, begins to get worried. He begins to get in a situation where he's like, you know, um, I, I think that these people are going to leave me and they're going to go back to David. If they hear about what's happening and it all happens and he makes one of the dumbest decisions of his life based off of a conversation he did not have with someone else, but a conversation he had with himself. Can I say something to you? Many of us in this place, we think that the only conversations we are having are when we talk to another person. But can I present to you, you are constantly conversating with yourself. And if you are doing the conversation with yourself the wrong way, you will end up with terrible decisions in your life that will have horrible consequences because you do not know how to properly talk to yourself. It said Jeroboam thought to himself. He thinks something stupid and he doesn't invite the Holy Spirit or Jesus. He doesn't invite God into the internal conversation with himself. You see, God showed me, he said, listen, he said, there's a table, Gavin. And he said, you're sitting at the table and we invite voices to the table every single day. He said, you're having internal conversations with yourself. You're coming to the table and you have a, something presented to you, a choice in your life, a situation that comes up. Something happens with your kids. You all of a sudden have an internal conversation. It could be good or bad. Something's happening in your marriage. You begin to have an internal conversation. And he says, there are voices, Gavin, that come and sit to the table. There is the voice of circumstances. Your circumstances, do you know, have a voice. So the way things are going good or they're going bad, it comes and takes a seat at the table and it begins to speak to you. The voice begins to speak. There's the voice of fear. Do you know fear has a voice? It comes to the table and it begins to get its way into the conversation. Well, what if this happens? And, you know, I don't know. And well, if we do that and, and then there's the voice of uh, money that lack has a voice. Abundance has a voice. Faith has a voice. They all come to the table and the Holy Spirit told me, he said, Gavin, when are you going to invite me to come to the table and have a voice? And what is this table? The table is the inner conversation you are having with yourself on a daily basis. Let me show you this from the word. This is absolutely incredible. The, the Bible says in Matthew 16, 22 through 25, it says that Peter is talking to Jesus and Peter comes to Jesus and Jesus is like, listen, I'm about to die. I'm going to go to the cross. It's all going to happen. Peter comes and he said, okay, Lord, uh, I think you woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. You know, uh, I don't know. Like you missed it today. You usually are right on, but you're missing it. Let me take you aside and correct you a little bit, Jesus. Let me help you out. Right? So he goes and Peter's like, listen, you're not going to go to the cross. You're not going to die. There's no reason for you to do this. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. That's intense. He's not calling Peter Satan. He's calling the attitude that Peter is coming in from the devil. And the Bible says these words, you are not seeing things from God's point of view, but you're seeing things based on human reasoning. You, Peter, when I was talking, you had this internal conversation with yourself. And because it didn't make sense to you, you thought I was wrong. In other words, Peter, 
you think it has to make sense to you for it to be right. We come to church all the time. We're hearing truth from the Bible. I don't know. That doesn't really make sense. Like, I don't really know if I want to receive that like that. I don't really like the way he said that. I don't really like what's going on here. You know, I don't know. it doesn't really make sense to me, so it, it can't be true. There's got to be something else going on. I don't really want to receive that. Does it have to make sense to you, therefore, for it to be God? Are you saying that you're going to understand everything that God is saying right away? Are you saying that your mind is as high as the mind of God? Because Jesus rebukes human reasoning. He rebukes the way that we reason things without him. He rebukes the way that we come to a situation and we ask our wife about it first. We ask our kids about it. We'll ask another mentor about it. We'll ask our business partner about it. We'll ask people who aren't even saved about it. But we don't go to the Holy Ghost and ask him his opinion about it. God rebukes the way that we reason things without him. Watch this, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 17. It says that before you were saved, you used to reason the way the world reasoned. But now that you've been saved, you had a blood transfusion. The blood of Jesus now is in you. You are now a son and a daughter of God. However, it means you also changed. You know that you're not an American citizen first. Did you know that? You're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven first. Do you know that's why you don't have to be afraid of what happens in the world around you? Because your citizenship was not to America first. That's why you don't have to abide by America's economy first. That's why you don't have to abide by America. Whoever's in office, who's not in office, all those things, we should pray for them for sure. We should vote for sure, all that. But you understand, you're not under anything they do because you're part of a higher kingdom that you abide by. Do you really understand that? Because you wouldn't be worried about these things that are happening. You'd want to pray for them. You'd want to help people get out of fear. But you yourself as a believer should never be gripped by fear because your God is sitting on the throne. He's never changed. You can't vote him in and out of office. Nobody voted him in. They can't vote him out. There's nothing that we can do about it. Do you understand that his economy flows on a certain way? And if you just abide by his principles, you're going to get what heaven gets. You used to reason the way the world did, but now that you're saved, you should be thinking through things differently. When your kid shows something that worries you, you shouldn't go about it the same way this mom who isn't even saved goes about it. When something's happening in your city that is against what God says, you shouldn't go about it by just saying, oh, you know, I'm just going to be a whatever. No, you've been given the power of the kingdom of God. You've been given authority in your hand, and God has given you the power to bring truth into a situation that is going to affect families, that is going to affect people around you. And if you don't speak up, the Bible says God will hold you accountable so who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to all these other voices? Or are you going to invite the Holy Ghost to the table of the inner conversation you're having? You're having conversations with yourself right now about me. <laughs> Did you know that? Some of y'all, maybe they're good conversations. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to listen a little bit. And then some of y'all are like, who is this young guy who's on the stage right now in a green jacket with these buttery white shoes? Thank you. Thank you. Talking to me like this, right? You're having conversations with yourself. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says this. God calls us ambassadors. This is really, really important to understand because when you understand what an ambassador does, it will change your life. Paul, two times in the New Testament, calls us ambassadors. This is really important because what an ambassador does is this. An ambassador is sent from the kingdom whatever kingdom he represents, and this is really cool. The food, when he's on the trip, is paid by the kingdom. The cars that come and pick him up or take him to his place is paid by the kingdom. The clothes that he wears is paid by the kingdom. All of the bills on his tab are all paid by the kingdom. There's only one condition. He can never represent his own opinion. The moment he represents his own opinion and not the opinions of the kingdom he was sent from, he's cut off from the flow of the blessing. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of these 
things will be added unto you. Why? Because as long as you don't represent your own opinion and you represent God's, then yeah, whatever you, all your clothes are paid for, all the food's paid for, all the things for your family's paid for. You're not going to have to worry about any of your needs because you're an ambassador. God will take care of you because you're take caring, taking care of God's business. When you make God's priority your priority, he'll make your priorities his priority. He'll make the things that are in your life that you need his first concern. God will pay your bills when you make sure you're representing his authority in his kingdom. So here's the thing. If you no longer have the right to represent your own opinion, you no longer have the right to your own opinion. I didn't make this up. This is the Bible. You're an ambassador. Ambassadors cannot represent their own opinion. Let me say it like this. There is no such thing as Democrat or Republican or independent first. You don't get to vote Democrat or Republican first. You get to vote Bible. You get to vote Bible. You look in the Bible and you find what God says about everything and you vote that. Why? Because you're an ambassador. You actually don't have the right to your own opinion. I remember I was watching an Oprah years ago. And Oprah was with somebody, and, and anyway, um, she was disagreeing with something he said. And it was about, you know, something he, he had studied or whatever. And she's like, but that can't be true because of blah, blah, blah. And he's just like, um, listen, Oprah, he got all defensive. He's like, I have a right to my own opinion. And the moment I heard it, God said, do you think, Gavin, you have the right to your own opinion? I was like, Lord, I know you don't ask the question you don't already know the answer for. So I'm guessing I don't. Some of us are more faithful, committed to our party than we are the kingdom of God. You more identify with a Democrat or Republican or an independent more than you identify as a son and daughter of the king. Your family is found more in your party than it's found in the family of Christ. This is an issue. What's going to happen to your life is you're going to go into life and decisions without the backing of the kingdom behind you. And can I tell you, you don't want to do that. But if you go in knowing that I don't represent my own opinion, I represent God's, guess what happens? Not one word you say will fall to the ground. Not one thing you do will not be blessed. Not one place you go will God not have your back. Why? Because you're not representing your own agenda. You're representing his. I'm telling you, you need the power of God in your family. You need the power of God on your kids. You need the power of God in your schools. You need it on your job. You need it, but you got to be committed to saying, I'm no longer for myself. I'm for God first. If you'll become a church like this, then this church will take over Springfield because God gets behind people who are behind what he prioritizes. Hallelujah. Let's just continue. Let, listen to how God is with thoughts. This is Psalm 139, verse 2. This is amazing. It says, I know the thoughts. He said, I saw before you ever stood up or sat down, I saw you do it. I know my thoughts even when I'm far away. God saw the thoughts before it came to your mind. What's that saying? When you pray, for instance, you have to have a thought to know what to say, but God heard the thought as it was coming to your mind. Thoughts actually have voices for God. You didn't say it out loud, but God heard it. So every prayer you pray, he heard twice. He heard it when the thought was coming to your brain, and then he heard it when you said it out loud. At least twice, because we'll get to why it probably is a lot more in just a second. Luke 7, 36 through 40. This is an amazing instance. It says the woman comes and breaks the alabaster box at Jesus' feet, right? She comes and pours the perfume all over his head. It says it drenches him from his hair all the way through his beard, all the way down his clothes. This was a total sacrifice, a total life given and laid down. But the uh, owner of the house, Simon, he's there and he's like... Um, man, this is all a bunch of waste. He's not saying it out loud. It says that he began to say to himself, is this man was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then listen, Jesus answered his thoughts. 
Jesus answered his thoughts. You didn't think I was listening, but I hear what you're thinking. You didn't think that I was listening because you didn't say anything out loud. But Jesus says, I've been listening to the internal conversation you've been having. You see, we internally, we might not out loud cuss somebody out, but internally we're doing it. We might not out loud be gossiping because we're like, I got to be a good Christian. And it's good. You need to withhold that. But at the same time, God already knows what's really going on in your head. He's not obtuse to what's happening on the inside of you. Jesus answers thoughts. He doesn't just answer words. Woo. How many thoughts do you have going through your mind? Well, you have just under one thought per second. 48 thoughts per minute, 3,000 thoughts per hour, 60 to 70,000 thoughts per day. 80% of these thoughts are negative for a normal person. 95% of these thoughts are repetitive because your brain loves the same thing again, patterns again and again. In other words, and this is a whole nother sermon in itself, but I'm just gonna say this to you. If you wanna be more hungry for God, you have to begin eating. Because your brain, the way it's created and the way your spirit is created, is you will always hunger for the thing you already fed on. Gavin, how do I get hungry for God? You got to start taking small bites right now. Because you're going to hunger again for the thing you already fed on. Why do you always go back to Netflix? Because you watch Netflix every single night. So your brain is used to watching Netflix. Why do you always go back to spending all that time in the romantic novels that you read? Because you've read 50 already. Your brain knows that. Why do you always go back to going to bed? Because your brain knows it's time to go to sleep, right? There are habits that are created. Why are you hungry at that time every single day? Because it's usually the time you eat. You're triggering yourself to be hungry again. Listen, in the physical, if you want to get hungry, you just don't eat. In the spiritual, if you want to get hungry, you eat. In the spirit, you get hungrier by eating. In the physical, you get hungry by not eating. It's repetitive. It's patterns. It's things that are going on again. You're returning to these. Now, if these patterns are toxic... You're returning to toxic patterns. But if you begin to make a habit of inviting the Holy Ghost in every moment, that decision, that conversation, Holy Spirit, I would usually do it this way, but I gotta, I'm gotta, i going to be intentional by inviting you in to this thing that's going on inside me right now. There's a table that's set, and all these voices are speaking, but God, I want to hear your voice. It's going to become easier and easier to do. We make around 35,000 conscious decisions each day. And about 227 of those are about food alone. (laughs) That's interesting. Anyway, so here's what I want to get to. Why can you trust the Holy Spirit's guidance in every one of your conversations? Why would we trust the Holy Ghost? Why would we want to address him in every single moment in every conversation? So let's jump out of this thought by thought view, and let's go into a 30,000 foot view just real quick. So let's just think about time, time in itself. Now, it's not important that you can read this all the way in the back. It's important that you can see, basically, there's a structure here, okay? So watch this. There is the beginning of time, which is creation. There is the end of time. Jesus comes back right here, and then the end. There's all the things of revelation, whether you believe it's pre, post. We're not going to get into all that. Praise God. By the way, I'm not pre-trib. I'm not post-trib. I'm pan-trib. It's all going to pan out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so the, at the beginning before creation and before the end, before the beginning is God. After the end is God. So just so you understand time, God is not within time only. He's outside of time. He's bigger than he's before the beginning, and he's already after the end. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning of all things in the end. He's timeless. He's formless. He has no beginning, right? 
So that being the case, if God is already outside of it, he's also in time all at the same time. Let me prove this to you. God is not able to have a future. Ephesians 3, 19 through 20, I'll just let you know, because he cannot be not be somewhere because he's omnipresent. Omnipresent means I'm everywhere. It doesn't just mean I'm everywhere in the moment you're in. It means I'm omnipresent in all of time at the same time. So God is not just encapsulated in t- today in 2023. He's also in all of time. He's omnipresent. So it's impossible for him to not be somewhere already. He doesn't have a tomorrow because it would mean he wasn't already there. Impossible. He's also omniscient. Omniscient means all knowing. He can't learn anything. So for him to have another day that he hasn't already been in means he'd be learning something new. Impossible. God cannot learn. So he has no future. Ephesians 3, 19 through 20 says this. I know the thoughts I have for you, right? That's, Psalm, that's Jeremiah 29, 11. And then in Ephesians 3, 19, he already knows the thoughts. But he said, I have planned, right, above and beyond all you could ask, think, or imagine. Say this again. Say ask. Say think. Say imagine. Now, how could God say that he will do exceedingly above all you ask, think, or imagine if he doesn't already know what you would have asked, thought, or imagined? Numbers 23, 19 says it's impossible for God to lie. He cannot lie. It's not that he doesn't want to lie. He's incapable of lying. So in other words, God can never say something that's a theory. He can only say things that's already proven to be true. Track with me. That means that for God to say, I can do exceedingly above and beyond all you ask, think, or imagine, it's because God went all the way through the end of time already, and he saw something, and every single thing you would ask, you would think, and you would imagine without him, he already saw it. And he said, I can do better than that. I can do better than that. I can do better than that. So now he speaks backward to us in time. And he said, I can do exceedingly above all you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Because I've seen it and it's nothing. It's subpar. But with me, David says, with God, I can crush an army. With God, I can leap over a wall. With God, I can. There's nothing that can come against a person with God. Never forget this. You plus God is always the majority. You got to hear what I just said. You plus God is always the majority. So he has no future. He has no past. How can he not be somewhere? So in other words, Abraham is right here, right? So there's creation. There's Abraham. There's Moses a little bit further down. We're jumping way ahead in time now. This is Jesus. Here's the cross, the resurrection, right? There's the apostles. This is the book of Acts. Now it's your birth. We're going way ahead in time. When you were born, whatever year that was, within the last, you know, 20, 30 years, you're all so young. Praise God. Your birth right here. And then there's your death. Whatever day that's going to be, right? Then there's the year 3,500. Say we lived that long. 45 500 say time is still going before Jesus. We don't know the day Jesus is coming back, but who does know the day? Only the father knows the day. How could he know the day? Because he's already there. So watch, okay? So listen, we, God no longer has a future or a past. So everything for God is in the present. It's all now. There's no past. There's no future. So that means that even though Abraham, we read about him, what he did, it's in the past for us. It's not in the past for God. He's watching right now. Abraham is lifting up the knife and he's about to kill his son Isaac right now for God. Right now for God, Moses is lifting up the staff and the Red Sea is parting. Right now for God. It's in the past for us. Right now, Jesus is being lifted up on the cross and he's resurrecting. Right now in the mind and the heart of God. Right now, the the Holy Spirit is descending in the book of Acts chapter 2 over the 120. And now 3,000 people are getting saved from one man who was so ashamed and such a coward. His name was Peter that he denied Jesus three times. But the moment the Holy Ghost gets on him, the same man who was a coward steps up on the steps and is able to preach a message so bold 3,000 people get saved in the street he's watching that right now he sees the day you're born he also sees the day you die he's watching your funeral right now he's watching all the people giving the speeches for what you did with your life he's watching your kids you know mama she was such a great woman he's watching it 
He's watching. He knows whether you're getting cremated or whether you're in a casket. He sees it. He already sees in the future. He knows the day Jesus is coming back. Jesus, God is there at all times at this time. Remember before creation ever began, in the beginning, God. Now that word God actually means God's. It's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all there. Why is this important? Because Psalm 39 verse 139 verse 16 says this, I wrote all your days in a book before you ever lived one of them. Now many people think that means, well, uh, I guess, you know, when I get to heaven, all the mistakes I made, all the good things I did, God's going to be like, show me a book. See, it's already all in there. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, according to Ephesians 1, God has predestined a purpose for every single one of us. It doesn't mean that we follow that purpose, but God has destined for every single human being on earth, whether they're saved yet or they're not saved yet. He's destined a purpose. He's destined a plan for every single one of them. And that is this. This is the plan of God. Now, you have a choice every day to choose life or to choose death. You have a choice to choose God's plan for your life or your own plan for your life. You could just go through the motions of time just like everybody else does. You could just keep flowing this way, or you could connect to the Holy Ghost who was there before time began. Before time begins, God the Father is there having a mind. He's drawing a map of your life. Jesus the Son is there, and then the Holy Ghost is looking over the shoulder of God, and he's looking at the plan of your life being written by the Father. So the father is drawing out the map of your life because he's about to send the Holy Ghost to say, you got to go and make this thing happen. So wouldn't you want to be connected to the one who is there when the plan was being written? The one who is there who knows exactly every step? Because remember, you will not be judged in heaven based on what you did. You will be judged on heaven whether you followed this plan. Not your own plan. Matter of fact, God will open up his book he wrote for your life, and then he'll compare it to the life you lived. And anything that is in your life that you lived that is not the same as what was already in his book, he cast into the fire. This is why it's important to know God's will for your life. You can't just, well, it's all going to work out, you know, and... He works everything out for the good of those who love him. So, you know, I'll just do my own thing my whole life and I'll get to heaven and he'll just be like, well done. Nah, 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 nah. You might have spent your entire life doing something that's out of God's will. You can literally spend your life being in church, but never seeking God for your life, never wondering what that purpose was, because whether it was intimidation or fear, whatever it was, and you didn't seek God's purpose for your life, and you could get to heaven, it's possible. The Bible says many will suffer loss. In other words, we'll get to the throne, and not everybody will be shouting right away. There'll be people who suffer loss. They get up there and they say, oh, I didn't find out what you wanted me to do. I didn't seek God for the plan he already had for me, which is good, which is perfect, which is pleasing. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, plans to bring you hope. In other words, we know it's a good plan, but have you chosen it? Have you sought God for it? The greatest way to get on this plan is to ask the Holy Ghost in this moment and to involve him into the conversation right now. Because the Holy Spirit will only lead you to the plan God has. The Holy Spirit will only tell you the things God already planned for you. The Holy Spirit is not going to the timeline of our public uh, entities. He's not going to the timeline of who's in office. He's not going by the rises and falls of our economy. He's not on any of that. He's on the timeline of God himself. He's not at all subject to these things that are happening. He's with God. Now, this is so incredible. Um, God tells us right here in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, this is what's so great. When you're walking on God's path, watch what happens. The Bible said that there's no temptation that comes to man that God doesn't already know. And he provides a way of escape before you even get there. So God is so good to you that he already sees where you're gonna be tempted. He already sees the moments where the enemy's gonna try to trip you up. He already sees what's gonna happen and he places an exit door attached to the problem before you get there. He places an exit door before you get there because he loves you that much. And if you're walking in God's plan, you'll address the Holy Ghost and he'll lead you to the exit. 
you will not be overtaken by this again. Some of y'all have been in cycles. You're falling to the same stuff you fell to 15 years ago. 10 years ago, you've been in cycles, but the Holy Spirit is here to say, I'm ready to break the cycle. I'm ready to break the rotation of shame. I'm ready to break the rotation of guilt. I'm ready to move in and give you the exit door that's always been there, but I'm waiting for you to address me. I'm waiting for you to invite me to the table of the inner conversation. We don't reason anymore the way the world does. We reason a different way. Can somebody say hallelujah? Woo, Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 says that this right here, this plan is going to take some prayer to understand. Paul says, I pray for you. I'm asking God that he'll give you spiritual wisdom, that he'll give you insight, that you might grow into this knowledge of what God has for you. I pray that your hearts would be flooded with light. I pray that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those who are called the holy people for which is your glorious inheritance. This is an inheritance and you're going to have to seek the Holy Ghost to find it. Psalm 57 two says, God's going to make sure this purpose happens. If you'll commit to making sure that you'll seek him, he'll back you up. Philippians two 13. I love this promise. It says that God is working within you. He's giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. You see, a lot of us have desire. You got desire for days, but you got no follow through. I want this, God. I want this. You know, the rich young ruler, he wanted it. Do You know, he came to Jesus and he fell on his face. Jesus, how do I get the kingdom? How do I get the kingdom of God? How? You can see him. He's got desire. But Jesus is not like any other man. He tells the rich young ruler to stand up. And he says, how can I get the kingdom? He says, follow the commandments. He said, oh, man, I've done all of those. He's feeling good about himself. But Jesus knows how to look inside of your heart. And he looks past desire. And he actually looks at what is keeping you from getting closer to him, and he addresses it. He says, oh, um, you got an issue with things and money. Hey, just sell all your possessions. Come follow me. Doesn't mean everybody has this issue, but this man was in love with his possessions. And these possessions were keeping him from getting closer. Because don't you understand Jesus wants to be closer to you than you want to be closer to him? Don't you know he actually wants it more than you want it? So he looks inside and he says, just let go of the one thing that's keeping you from me. And the man walks away depressed because he loved his many things. Listen, y'all, Jesus will look inside and he'll say, hey, I want to be close to you too. I want you to know my plan. But this right here, this right here, this belief that you have, this false belief you've been living by, these lies you've been accepting, I got to address this. These things right now, these beliefs, the way you've been gossiping, your tongue needs to get cut off a little bit. You talk too much. You talk way too much about people. I got to help you with this. He's a good father. He'll come in and say, man, uh, the way that you look at yourself, the things you believe, how you talk to yourself, it's, it's killing you. I need to suck this from you so that life can fill your mouth. And now you can bring yourself into life, bring yourself into joy because your mouth right now is being used to destroy yourself. The way you fight in your home, you come to church, you're looking one way, but then you go home and your home is a war zone. Conflict. That's not the home that I planned for you, Jesus says. He says, I want you to have a home of peace where you sense the presence of God at all ways. I don't want your kids to be having nightmares. I don't want your grandchildren to be going through that. They shouldn't be having that. Matter of fact, you shouldn't be standing for that in their life. So I want to come with you. Let's partner together. But you got to address me. You got to look inside. You've been reasoning one way. But would you invite me to the table? Would you invite me to the table? I am timeless. The Holy Spirit is way older than you are. Did you know that? You know, in our society, when we look for wisdom, what do we usually look for? The oldest person in the room. Where are the old people at? I need some wisdom. Well, the Holy Ghost is not just thousands of years old. He's timeless. He's been through every single plague in all of history and he brought people through he's been through every single persecution he brought people through matter of fact he beat inside of the chest of Jesus while Jesus was walking on earth 
It said that when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he drew him out into the wilderness and Jesus came back in the power of the Holy Ghost after fasting for 40 days. What does that mean? It means that the same spirit that's in you right now in Springfield, Illinois, is the same Holy Ghost that was inside of the chest of Jesus. He didn't give us a different spirit. He didn't give us a partial spirit. He gave us the Holy Ghost. He gave us the spirit that was inside giving Jesus wisdom. It's the same one giving you wisdom. Helping Jesus know how to respond to those Pharisees when they were being idiots. He'll help you to respond to idiots the right way. He's there. He's helping Jesus to know how to peel the power that's coming through Jesus' hands. Guess who it is? The Holy Ghost. And he's the same power that's inside of you. You see there's something that you have that's right here. It's every answer you need. Did you know the answers you need in your life are closer than you think? They're just right here. Every ounce of wisdom you need for your kid, it's right here. Every ounce of wisdom you need for your job, it's right here. Your body is his temple. He's on the inside of you. Have you addressed him? Are you asking his thoughts? Or are you just going on with the conversation and you never invite him to the table? Can you imagine Genesis 18, 12 through 15? God tells Abraham, you're going to be the father of many nations. He's too old now. What's going on with Sarah? She's in the tent. What's she doing? Laughing. But she didn't laugh out loud. The Bible said she laughed to herself. God comes. Why is your wife laughing? She said, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. You did laugh, God says. I heard you laughing on the inside. Woo! Cain, when his countenance changed, remember when Abel brought a better sacrifice than Cain, what happens with him? It said he's there and his countenance shift. Not a huge thing, just the countenance goes down. And God notices, hey, you're thinking thoughts right now. You're, there's something going on in your head. Hey, Cain, I want to I wanna just step in real quick. Sin is crouching at the door, but you can overcome it. But don't let this conversation inside of your head go on without me coming in. You got to let me come in and help you now, Cain. Because you can master this thing that's trying to master you. You got the power to do it, but you got to ask me for help. I'm trying to warn you. I love you. What about Mary when they started coming and Jesus was, was lost for three days? They literally lost the son of God. That's pretty crazy. But they find him in the temple. He's 12 years old and he's schooling all the other rabbis. And Mary comes and it said that Jesus was found. And they're upset at him. And he goes, why are you upset at me, woman? He goes, don't you know I'm about my father's business? Right to the father and the mother. Y'all ain't my real daddy and my real mama. Thank you for bringing me into this world, but y'all know who I am. I'm about my father's business. And the Bible said that Mary held and pondered all of these words that people said about Jesus in her heart. You see, mothers, you got to ponder the great times about your children. You can't just think about the catastrophe they're in. You can't be going back to all of the worst things that happened. You got to be holding in the moments that God answered prayer. You got to be pondering inside, conversating to yourself all the miracles that God has made already for your grandchildren, for your children, for the people you love. Are you pondering those things in your heart or are you just digesting the enemy's lies? Can you imagine if Hitler would have had somebody talk to him? The Bible said he had, six, actually, there's six different chances on history literally recorded that Hitler had to receive Jesus. God's trying to constantly, Stalin, my God, wouldn't that be great if he would have just, you know, maybe it's not the greatest idea. If he would have had somebody, could have heard the Lord. David and Bathsheba, how about that? Second Samuel, remember he's out on the roof, he's not supposed to be there. And what's going on? He's going out. He's supposed to be somewhere else. He's supposed to be in battle, but he wasn't in the place he was supposed to be. So he's getting tempted with something he was never supposed to be tempted by. Because when you're in the wrong place, you're not supposed to be. You're getting tempted by something you never should have been tempted by. But he's there and he's looking out and he sees the woman. I thought there's a conversation that starts going on. If he would have just invited God, something could have happened. Think about the mistakes. Moses in the wilderness talked to the rock. But he had an anger problem. Anger kept Moses from the promised land. Anger and rage will keep you from your promise as well if you don't submit it to God. It said that he's there and he got so angry at the people. He was supposed to speak to the rock. But anger overtook him and he hit the rock. 
He was listening to the voice of anger more than the voice of God. There's a moment. There's a moment. I'm going to close with this and then we're going to pray. Could you start that music real quick? You see, there are different strategies that we use to decide. These are all medically found. You can find these in science. This is literally the way that we decide things. Number one is impulsiveness. It means we leverage the first option you are given and then you just do it. You're impulsive. First option that comes, boom, you do it. That's not a good way to live life. Second, compliance. This is a different way. Some people do it this way. They process in this way. They choose what is the most pleasing option, the most comfortable option, the most popular option as it pertains to those who are impacted. So they're looking for what is comfortable, what's not gonna ruffle the feathers, what's not gonna whatever. And so they live their life by compliance. They just wanna stay in line. They don't wanna upset anybody. That's not a way that Jesus will use you in your life. I promise Jesus himself upset people. You're going to too. Number three, delegating. This is where people don't want to take the ownership of their decision. So they don't make the decision themselves, but they push off the decision for somebody else to make it for them. We all know people like this. They can't make decisions for themselves. Mom, what do you think? Dad, what do you think? You're 25 years old now. Number four, avoidance or deflection. Some people do it like this. They either avoid or ignore decisions in an effort to avoid the responsibility of their impact. So they just simply prevent them from overwhelming them by avoiding or deflecting it. I I don't, (laughs) if I I mess up on this decision, I don't wanna be dealt with that. So I'm just not gonna make the decision. I'm just gonna act like I never heard it. Boop, boop, boop. It's not a way that God wants you to live. He wants you to be bold. He wants you to know what his will is and he wants you to do it. Number five, there's only two more, balancing. It means we weigh the factors involved, we study them, and then we use the information to render the best decision in the moment. So these are people, you know, maybe it seems a little bit better, but this still isn't the place God wants you to be. You're looking at the factors, mm, mm, all of it, and you're reasoning, okay, that would have this consequence, that would have this, and then you make the best decision. You might think that's good decision making, but it's still lower than God wants you to be. And the last one is this, prioritizing and reflecting. It's putting the most energy, thought, and effort into the decisions that will have the greatest impact. So you begin to prioritize certain decisions. You begin to put more emphasis on this. This is all natural people make this kind of decisions. But you're not called to just a natural life. You're called to live in a supernatural plane. You're not citizens of America first. You're citizens of heaven. The Holy Spirit, His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. And when you counsel with the Holy Ghost, you will actually make the greatest decisions possible. Proverbs says what? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, your own way of getting things done, your own way that you make decisions. That same process you go through, get rid of that. You got to get a renewed process. You got to get a renewed way of making decisions about relationships, about your job. You got to invite the Holy Ghost to the table because listen, he's the only one who will wait to be invited. Fear will not wait to be invited. It will invade the the conversation. Circumstance will not wait to be invited. They will invade the conversation. They're going to come uninvited. They're going to try to press their way into your life. But the Holy Ghost is not a thing. He's a person and he waits to be invited. Don't trust in the Lord all your, but lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. In everything you're doing, hey, Holy Ghost, I just want to know that I'm doing the right thing. I think this is the right decision. What do you think? Is this the right decision, Lord? Before I go and tell my wife this, is this what, what you would want me to say? Before I go and talk about the leaders in my church, is this the way you would want me to act? Before I go and I make my own decisions about my business or this, Lord, is this what you would want me to do? God, I'm here for you. I don't want to lean on the way that I've processed things. I want to be different, God. I want to make decisions you want me to make. Mark 5, 25 through 29, and this is how we're going to end. 
You know, David in Psalm 42, before we say Mark 5, it said that he woke up one day and he didn't know why he was depressed. He didn't know what was going on. And it said he actually had to talk to himself. He said he looked at himself and he said, um, what's going on, soul? Why are you downcast? This isn't the way God made you. You're not supposed to be feeling this way. Some of us wake up, we don't know why we feel the way we feel. We don't know why we feel discouraged the way we feel. We don't know what is going on. But you can't just let your emotions run your day, run your week, run your month. You got to interrupt the conversation that's already going on and say, you will praise God. You will get up and thank the Lord. <clears throat> God is still on the throne and the devil is still defeated. My family, God, you already told me will be saved, so I won't be worried about this. Mark 5 says there's a woman. And it said she reached out. Jesus was walking. She had an issue of blood. And she saw thousands that were surrounding him. And it said she thought to herself. She had a great thought. If I could just touch. If I could just touch him. I know I'll be made whole. Great conversation. Great result. Great decision. She sneaks through. The Bible says she acts on the great conversation that happened within her. And she touches him. And she was healed on the spot. You see, there were thousands of people that were surrounding Jesus that day. There were hundreds that were rubbing up against him. They weren't getting healed right away. God didn't, didn't say those are happening. Jesus, of course, was healing people. But they were rubbing up against. Let me tell you, it's the same thing today in churches all over America. There are people who are sitting in churches who are believers that want to be around the move of God. They want to be around things that Jesus is doing. They want to rub up against something, hopefully catch something, keep their same lives, but want to rub up against something. But listen, there are those who knew how to pull out of God. There are many that surround him, but there are only few who know how to pull from him. This woman touched me differently. I have her eye closed. I'm going to ask two questions. Number one, do you know Jesus? He's here for you. He loves you. Maybe you can sense his presence through this word right now. If you want peace with God, let me ask you, do you have peace with God? Are you sure without a shadow of a doubt that if you died, you would go to heaven? Are you sure? There's two altar calls today. This is the first one. I want you right now, if you say, Gavin, I want to have this peace. I want to be totally sure. I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want you to stand to your feet if you've raised your hand. Be bold about it right now. You already lifted your hand. Just stand up. I promise I'm not going to embarrass you. Thank you. Every person right where you're at, thank you. In this precious moment, because we need to move on, I want to say right now, thank you so much for being bold to stand up for God. There are workers that are looking around right now to see who you are. Make sure they're follow up. I want to ask you all, including the people sitting down, to pray this prayer with me out loud. Could you say, dear Lord Jesus? Come on, say it. Dear Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. Thank you for being my Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sin right now. You've washed me with your blood and I receive a new life. Lord, I've come for you. I thank you that you died on the cross and rose from the dead. Lord, from this moment on, I dedicate to becoming a disciple. I will not just say this prayer but I'm going to take the next step. Train me. Help me. Mentor me. God, show me the right people to talk to. From this moment on, I want to be a disciple. And I thank you for forgiving me. I'm no longer guilty. I'm no longer guilty. But I am now saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. And I thank you right now that I'll never be the same. 
give him a hand every single person who just prayed come on now come on God bless you all God bless you all thank you Jesus Woo! yes every eye still stay closed we have five minutes left let me just tell you this right here this is the one I wanted to do this morning big time in this last few minutes if you say you know what Gavin I need an interruption I need an interruption in my life in my patterns I need an interruption in my thoughts I need an interruption in the way that I'm deciding things I need an interruption in the way I'm talking about things I need an interruption I need a recalibration I need to refocus again back on the Holy Ghost I want to reinvite him to the table I know he's always been there I know he loves me I, I I'm not saying you're not saved what I'm saying is this you are living a life less than you're living in a place less than your thoughts. You're not getting the results that God wants you to have, the joy of your salvation. If you're living according to what the world is giving you and you're not living according to God's plan, you don't have to worry about 30 years from now. You don't have to worry about 10 years from now. You know what the great news is? The Holy Spirit is there with you right now. He's going to lead you to the right place. But are you focusing on Him? Have you invited Him? Some of y'all need a breakthrough with your children. Some of y'all need a breakthrough in family. Some of y'all need a breakthrough with your own emotions. Some of y'all need to have fire lit underneath you for souls because it's the heart of God. Every person who's in here, you say, that's me, Gavin. I need to recalibrate. I want to invite the Holy Ghost back into the first place. I need you to walk up here right now. Walk up here right now. Do not delay. Walk up here right now and put your hands in the air. Could you turn up that music, please? Come on, walk up here, put your hands in the air, begin praying right now. You don't have to wait for me. Come on, all the way to the right. Walk all the way around here. Walk all the way around here. Come on, begin to repent right now. Say, Lord God, I'm sorry, Lord, I haven't addressed you. God, forgive me, Lord, for the things, God, I might have said or the things I did without counseling you. That asking you, God, cleanse my heart out right now. This is the beginning. This is a beginning of a new spark of revival and fire inside of you right now. It comes through repentance. Come on. Just tell him, Lord, I know, God, I might have missed some things, but God, I want to start again. Help me, Jesus, right now. Thank you, Lord. Right now, I'm going to ask you to just begin to praise the Lord, to ask him to help you. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, tell him, thank you, Jesus. If you pray in the Holy Ghost, begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. If you don't have a prayer language, begin to pray. Praise phrases. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. Awesome Lord. Wonderful Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Come on, praise Him. Let Him touch you. Let Him touch you right now. I'm praying that the power of the Holy Spirit begin to touch you right now. I'm asking him to move among you. There you go. You're getting the power right there. You're getting a touch from God. He's breaking through. I'm praying for addiction right now. I know you hate it about yourself. It's time to be set free. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He's speaking to many of you right now. Listen to his voice. What is he saying? If he's asking you and, and confronting you about something, just repent and let it go. Come on, he's not condemning you. He's convicting you. He wants you to repent and let it go because it's going to ruin your future. He's ready to move on with you. If he's telling you something, he wants you to prioritize. Listen to him. Listen to him. What's he speaking? Is he bringing up a face of somebody you need to forgive? Let it go. Is he talking about habits you have that aren't profiting you? Come on, ask him. What does he want you to do at that time? He's a counselor. Holy Spirit of God, we love you. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. answered prayers right now 
answered prayers among these people right now. I'm thanking you for clarity coming for decisions right now. I'm thanking you for a breakthrough of clarity. Breakthrough of clarity. There will be no more confusion. I rebuke, I remove confusion in the name of Jesus. There is a, there is a cloud that's moving out. A confu it's not there. God does not talk within confusion. He talks within peace. He does not talk within confusion. He talks within peace. He's giving you peace right now. He's leading you to the right decision. Praise God. Man, the anointing is getting strong here. This is beautiful. Man, I can't wait for tonight. Dear God, Jesus, we just thank you. We touch you, God. We praise you right now that this morning we begin the conversation afresh. Lord, we acknowledge your presence. We know that you're with us. Our body's your temple. We look to you, the wise one, the oldest and wisest one, God, the one who knows where we need to go, the one who knows when I need to set my foot there, the one who sees us when I rise up, the one who sees us when I lie down, the one who's with us and knows every word that I say, and you saw the thoughts before they even came to my mind. God, I thank you that you're obsessed with me. I thank you, God, that you're obsessed with my life. I thank you, God, that you wrote my name on the palm of your hand. God, that I'm the center of your universe. Lord, I thank you for this love that I don't deserve. Come on. Thank you. You don't deserve someone to love you like this. But now he's asking something of you. He wants full dedication. He wants you to change your schedule. He wants you to let him shift you. He wants you to let him become the priority. He wants to get involved with your decisions, your words. God, we receive this right now. We receive this this morning. Thank you for your beautiful touch.